What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Journeyman, brought to you by the good folks at the DraftKings Network and Meadowlark Media. As always, I'm your host, Andrew Hawkins, seven years in the NFL, two Great Cup championships in two years in the CFL, and one pulled hamstring this week. Uh, your boy is washed. We'll get into that. Uh, I'm joined today by my man, Dragonfly Jones. You know him on Twitter of the Jenkins and Jones podcast. Tyler, what's up, man? How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I appreciate you having me on, man. You know, big fan of what y'all got going on there up at Metal Luck, of course. You know, y'all fam. So, you know, happy to be on here. Again, appreciate you having me on, bro. Absolutely, man. You know, I I, I, I sat in on one of your conversations uh, with Dan Lebitar, and you were talking about the beast bracket. Hell yeah. And I could not help. I don't know if there was a more, like, unassuming, addictive conversation. Because I'm not like an animal person by any stretch of the imagination. But as y'all were talking about it, and you know, I'm not going to tease. Actually, you, you tell uh, the journeyman viewers what the beast bracket is. All right. So basically, you know, it's something that, that came about because there's absolutely nothing to talk about in the summer. Absolutely. Like, <laughs> you know what I'm Factuals. saying? So, yeah. So, you know, we had this this hypothetical animal fight tournament kind of in the format of, of March Madness. But. You know, the um, the unique thing about what we had here was we had a catch weight here, right? Like, so in combat sports, you know, boxing, MMA, there's always weight classes. So we were like, you know, the thing that's missing from these animal discussions is, you know, weight classes, right? Uh -huh. like, because, of course, a lion, ha you know, will, will maul a wolf one-on-one, -on -one, right? Of course. But if you get four 250-pound lions and 10 100-pound wolves at the catch rate of 1,000 pounds like we had for this, then we got ourselves a conversation, right? Like, that's a legit fight right yep. there. So yeah, so you know we we um you know we doing the catch weight stipulation. So we had all combinations of animals weighing up uh, you know against a thousand pounds facing off against each other, which which led to some unique combinations. And you know sometimes you'd have one big boy like one you know one thousand pound polar bear or you know a bunch of little guys like two hundred five pound roosters. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so so and um you know we opened it up to, to to the Twitter polls. You know the Twitter people um you know uh picked who they wanted to advance. You know in certain matchups uh we had an all online pick them contest that had like 2700 people who uh -huh. it. um and, and yeah and, and, so, and so you know the people spoke um the, the eight jet the eight 125 pound jaguars were eventually crowned the champs and you know i think that's a good uh choice right there I, I i think that that is a solid you know um um contender right there for best fucking you know combination of animal how, brawlers how many jaguars was it eight eight, eight, 125 uh, eight, eight 125 jags you know what yeah, when and, i was and the hit... championship match was against two 500 pound tigers so Okay, two five hundred pound tigers. Yeah, I like that. I think I think I think someone who got snubbed in it. I think I heard you say it was twenty five Wolverines. Yes, that, that they were good enough to win it all, bro. I think they should have won it all, bro. I think I yeah. think they got hosed. Because we, we might need to do a recount. We man. I think we got to do a recount. I think you should redo the bracket and just have like real life animal experts on there. To really make the determine, this might be a, a whole docu series. Metal Lark, I'm, <laughs> I'm giving y'all a layup here. This is a whole docu series that you're letting just slip through your fingers. We should be, we should be knee deep in development on this. But the Wolverines, the I always say like in football because I say it on this show all the time. Size isn't scary, speed is scary. Right. And if you have the combination of size and speed, you're the scariest. To your point about lions and tigers and all of that. But 25 Wolverines, as vicious as they are. Is a is a that's next level scary next level scary shit next level though yes because you know something that we always had in in, in, in our arguments is like you got to look at strength of schedule here and uh -huh. strength of schedule is basically you know what animals does this animal prey on does this animal fight on in the wild right uh -huh. and a, a forty pound wolverine can take down like a fucking thousand pound bison mm. right there's been stories of of a wolverine who snuck into a polar bear's enclosure in a zoo and killed the polar bear right like so the strength <sighs> of schedule with those animal, dudes man. is ridiculous right these guys are going to, uh, you know, Tuscaloosa and getting road winds and shit. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> I think I, the Wolverine might be the animal I identify with most. That's that's my kind of style, bro. Just yeah, unassuming, walk in, and I, I came I came for a problem. That's what I'm here for. What animal do you think you identify most with? Of all the animals in the bracket? That, that's a good question. Um, 
You know, I, I, I'd say, you know, going back to the roosters, I might be a rooster, bro. Like, you might be a rooster. Like, I, might, I feel like roosters are fearless, you know what I'm okay. saying? A little too fearless at times, right? Yeah. Like sometimes, you know, they bite off more than they can chew and and, and it doesn't, you know, wind up great for them. But but I might be a rooster, bro. I and we did that. athlete cons- com- comparisons, you know, to, to, uh, to these animals as well, on like the scout reports and Manny Pacquiao okay. was a rooster there. So, okay. You know. All right. So what, I, our first topic, we're, we're going to get into a little bit of sports documentaries. We're going to try to go through this quick in this first segment, but... What animal would you probably equate to Johnny Manziel? Hmm. What animal, you know, so so we got to kind of connect the dots here with like a bunch of potential that never panned out. Mm. Um, That's a tough think, one. Let me think on that. That's a tough one. Yeah, it is. It's a tough one. It's tough one. Maybe in the course of the conversation, the light bulb will come back on. Who, you know, who was your first upset on. in the bracket? The first upset the in the bracket. Upset, yeah. Yeah. The biggest, you know, like I said, I didn't like the three silverbacks taking out 25 Wolverines, of course. Okay. Yeah, um, of course. I thought that the water buffalo, we had one 1,000 pound water buffalo, uh-huh. and he got taken out by 20 50 pound pit bulls. And yeah, you know, pit bulls were literally bred to fight bulls, right? right. Like that's why they call pit bulls. They fought bulls in pits. But bro, water that. buffaloes are different, dog. Like lions don't even run up on water buffaloes one on one. You know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> All right. So the water the buffalo rider. didn't live up to its potential. And that's where we are with Johnny Manziel. Have you had the opportunity to watch the Johnny Manziel documentary on Netflix? I did. I did. What's did your, you it? What's your, what's your first takeaway from what you saw? Um, I think we need to preface it because, you know, I think all of us come into this with, with baseline and you need even extended knowledge about Johnny Manziel. So um, the thing about Johnny Manziel with me personally is he is the wrongest I've possibly ever been about an NFL prospect. Bro. Wow. You're on that, you're like, on that side of camp, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Because. Okay. I'm going to change your mind about that by the end of this conversation, but go ahead. Okay. I'll okay. Let you so, roll. um, because, you know, um, coming in, you know, there were doubts about Johnny Manziel, which is why I don't know about if you can necessarily call him a bust because, you know, people were saying he is not going to succeed at the next level because of these things. Right. right. And the three major gripes with him were, you know, he was undersized. Mm-hmm. Right. The other one was his mechanics. And then mm-hmm. there was like his off the field antics. Yeah. And that's the big, I will give you the rundown on why I, I so wrongly <laughs> disagreed with all those gripes. Right. <laughs> Right. So um, the first gripe was height. You know, he was undersized. And you got to keep in mind, this was in 2014. Right. So like like two of the top five QBs in the league were undersized at that time. Right. So I was like, why are we still doing this undersized thing to knock against quarterbacks when we've got, you know, Drew Brees and Russell Wilson out here? Of course. Them? You know what I'm yep. saying? Um, second gripe, you know, as I mentioned, was his mechanics. And, you know, as far as mechanics went, and, you know, and I'm still kind of on this boat. I, I just never was of the belief that non-conventional quarterbacks need to have conventional mechanics. Yeah. You know, you, you, you feel me? And yeah, like, yeah. again, th- this was 2014, bro. Like yeah, 2014 yeah, yeah. felt like the future, right? Like Cam Newton, you know, had perhaps the greatest rookie seat year of, of a QB a few seasons before that, like 4,000 yards, 800 um, yards rushing. Yeah. And, you know, we had that 2012 class with, you know, RG3, Russ, Cap. And it just felt like, you know, like I said, holding – a non-conventional quarterback's pocket mechanics against him. Against it it him. just was starting to feel especially, a bit, you know, Especially antiquated. when his, his his value proposition at the time was the fact that he was non-conventional. Like, right. that was the thing he brought to the table. So to hold him to that standard, when he doesn't check any of the other boxes, is ridiculous. You're, you're holding him to rules right. of a game he doesn't play. So I'm with exactly. you 100%. I want to hear this third one. of How did you get past all the off-field stuff? Of everything you had heard, I thought it was just a, a college kid doing college kid shit. I was okay. like, okay, he goes to frat houses and he parties and gets drunk. Like, what 21-year-old doesn't do that? Yeah, here's, you here's, know what I mean? Here's where you messed up, Dragonfly Jones. Hey, this, is, this is where you messed up. It's because oh, yeah. if it starts to bubble up, and we're going to call a spade a spade, for a white quarterback in Texas, if it starts to bubble up a little bit past outside of that bubble, you know it's probably a real problem, mm-hmm. right? Like, because uh, if it was just innocent college kid stuff, they probably would have kept it under wraps a little bit better than what they could, but they honestly couldn't contain it to where everyone in the country knew what time it was. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's how I thought. I didn't know it at the time. I don't want to make it seem like I was I was in front of the curve. I was not. I was team Johnny Manziel <laughs> through and through. Yeah, yeah. He, like I said, I, I just thought it was a bunch of old people, you know, shaking their fists at the cloud, like the undersized thing, the mechanics, the you know, the partying yeah. antics. But yeah, I was dead wrong. Listen, the the naysayers they nailed the fuck out of those three names. They got all three. <laughs> they went three for three 
three on the nays with Johnny Manziel. Steph Great job, Curry. naysayers. Hats off to y'all on that one. Johnny Football naysayers when Steph Curry on it. So I, I like yes. the documentary. And we'll probably actually bleed this into the next segment because this is we got a lot for this. And I've talked about Johnny on this show because I was front row for the Johnny Manziel experience. And as I watched the documentary, me and my wife watched it. And it was a it, I, we were extremely interested in it because, again, we had saw it firsthand because I was in Cleveland when he got drafted. And I played with him his entirety in Cleveland. And not only that, I was even more connected. But I remember when Johnny came in and there was so much fanfare around Johnny nationwide and in Cleveland. And we would be in the locker room. And for the entire two years, man, it was like Johnny was in his own world. So to hear on the documentary that he was dealing with all this pressure and depression and he just didn't want to to be there and he had all these like grand plans like almost ending it in his time there yeah it so perfectly matches up because we will be trying to a couple of us that were like more veterans on the team we will be trying to engage him and he literally wouldn't say a word to anybody in the locker room not like purposely but you could just tell he was he was dealing with stuff and when people talk about johnny manzel you know it's like josh gordon has substance abuse problems right and 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 him and johnny were there at the same time but when you look at josh and i've had family that uh, you know i come from a, the areas where substance abuse happens um and you know like okay this is something he doesn't have under control johnny's felt like he was in search of something like you didn't look at johnny in the way he was acting and say like oh man this guy is trying to fake it or like present as if he's not doing these things he was very clearly in a state of depression. Like his mentals yeah. weren't there. It was it was way too big for him. It felt like he was running from something. And you had players on the team who were like, they were, oh man, they were so addicted to the fame of Johnny Football. Like we all thought, okay, this we'll see what, if he can come in and really do what he says and people think he can. But there were players who were like trying to clamor to be around him to just get a little bit of that limelight that was cast on Johnny. And then there was other guys like Joe Hayden who was really trying to mentor him. He was trying to bring him in to be like, yo, man, we could, you could do something, you could do something with this. And I think, again, watching the documentary versus what it looked like in real life was just very, very interesting kind of back and forth. Yeah. That, you, you know, that's interesting that you gave us that kind of behind the scenes insight into where there was kind of, you know, a rallying around Johnny Menzel. Because um, that was, you know, a question I have for you. He's like, you know, what was it like at ground zero with the guy? Because, you know, we just had another, you know, Heisman winning quarterback who did not have a, a, a tenure there where it seemed like his teammates were rallying around, around no, him with Baker no, no, Mayfield, no. right? So, so yeah. So, so, so yeah, that was for sure a, a question that I had there. So, and, you know, you said you mentioned you were a Manzel guy. I know you kind of had to be in good faith as, as him being your quarterback, but, you know, unbiased opinion. Uh -huh. Did you think that he was going to, you know, fail or fly in the, in, in, in the NFL? That's a good question. I think it, it was, it was at a point that it was, it was hard to say, and not because of an ability thing. It was, could he get over this mental block of whatever was happening? You know what? Let's take a break and we're going to come back and I, I, I'll give you the full detail of what was going on behind the scenes and why I thought Johnny could be successful, but why I probably knew that he wasn't going to. Welcome back to Journeyman. We're joined by Dragonfly Jones, and we're talking Johnny Manziel documentary on Netflix. Before we took the break, Tyler, you asked me about, like, what I thought Johnny Manziel was going to be when he came, like, right. as a pro. Now, we would be in meetings every week, and he would be asleep. This is a first-round draft pick. He would be asleep in the front row. Like, you could fall asleep in the meetings, and you're trying to hide it. So in the documentary, he talks about how he was trying to do everything in his power to get out of the situation that he was in because it just it was too big for him. And that's crazy because I would look down and we would see him sleep in the corner of the room in front of the offensive coordinator, in front of the head coach. They would act like they didn't see him, but it was so very clear that he was trying to show he did not give a damn. Now, in the documentary, his agent, Eric Burkhart, talks about how they can – contract this whole like from the pre-draft to going radio silent then to after the draft and he was doing everything in his power to give this kid a chance to kind of turn the leaf and so I actually got really cool with Eric in that time he was his agent and what yeah. I was is I was kind of Eric's eyes and ears on the ground with Johnny Manziel and so I would like let him know yo this is what's going on this is what Johnny has going and I was like kind of looking out for Johnny in Cleveland and Eric was very appreciative of that. Now, I didn't know the lengths that EB was going through to try to keep him in the game. But 
because he was so appreciative, he actually introduced me to Maverick Carter. And that's how I met Mav and eventually interned and worked there and still work with him today for like the last seven years. And that's how I actually got that connection because I helped him out with Johnny. But what was crazy, Tyler, it was that it was weird to be in a documentary and know that you're in the middle of a, a future doc. Like this documentary, I think that's why I didn't like wasn't so excited about it. Because in the middle of it, I remember there was a what was the name of that documentary about the USC quarterback? Do you remember? Um, the thirty for thirty. The thirty for thirty. Um, about, about Rise of Troy or something like that. Something where it was like this, yeah. this, this, this dad like was basically like groomed this this kid to be the best quarterback, and he became it in USC. Oh, you talking about um the, the, the Tom Moranovich one? The Tom Moranovich one. Yeah, that was like big at the time. It was like not too old, maybe a couple years. And when Johnny was there. We would all reference that doc, and we were like, wow. "Be like, damn, bro, it's crazy." Like, we all knew that we were watching this documentary happen in real time, like the Johnny. And we all knew it was going to be called Johnny Football. Like that's the name of the documentary. Here we are, a decade later, mm-hmm. and it actually, it actually comes through. So it was weird to know you're in the middle of a documentary while it's happening. The thing I think the documentary missed on. Well, before I get to there, you talked about what you thought Johnny was as a player. What did you think, like, as from a fan perspective, like, what did you think of all the off the field stuff? Because it wasn't crazy to me, but I would imagine it was it was new information to you as you're watching a documentary. Yeah, um, you know, I, I think a huge takeaway here that I haven't heard a lot of people. I don't think I've heard anyone kind of mention is we don't get this documentary without the recent NIL legalization, right? Mm. Because these dudes admitted to everything, everything stuff we didn't you know. know. Right, right. And, and and it was a bit shocking, but I'll, I'm guessing obviously the NCAA can't retroactively punish you for something that's no longer illegal. So I don't think that there's any way this doc even gets made if Manziel's Heisman, you know, was in danger of being repossessed because, bro, these dudes, Manziel and, and his friend Nate admitted to lying to the NCAA <laughs> during the NCAA investigation about improper funds received. In- <laughs> bro, like that was, was kind of a takeaway here. Like without the NIL, we never get this documentary, at least that part, at least. Yeah, he was getting money, too. That's it. Yeah, cashed he was getting, out, dog. Cashed out. You know what? And this is taking a very serious turn that I don't like. So we got we, we to gotta call it for what it is, too. They didn't mention this. They talked about the hype. I don't think they did a good enough job building up the hype that was around Johnny Manziel. And why? He was white yeah. Vic, bro. That's why they yeah. loved him. It wasn't because he was a good quarterback and he had wins. It was because we had never seen a white mobile quarterback doing the that we see mobile yes. quarterbacks do, and everyone start. Oh, we was gas, bro. It wasn't yes, yes. just white people, black people. Every we, it was like, yo, this is crazy. He's out yeah. here really saucing people up. <laughs> right, right. Drake made a draft Drake, pick track for him and Andrew Wiggins. Right. And Drake ain't making no. Uh, tr- I'm trying to think of another good Texas. Like Ryan Mallett wasn't getting no Drake references, bro. <laughs> right. He's, Blake Bortles, the Blake number one QB taken in that draft, was not getting Drake. He tracked, wasn't bro. getting Drake. Right? That wasn't the cool of it. It was like, yeah. yo. This dude is running around spin moving. I've never seen a white guy spin right. move and and flick the wrist the way that Johnny Manziel was. A- absolutely. You know, you know, building to what you're saying and kind of tying it back to the NIL thing, I remember there was a conversation on Twitter about what past athlete would have made the most NIL money. And my vote was Johnny Manziel for the same reason you said. Yeah. A white boy with swag, mm-hmm. right? Like that you're printing money once you get that. You yeah. know, what I mean? a, a, and you got to be good at what you do, of course. And he was incredible in college. And like I said, he he had that white boy, you know, he was a white boy with the swag. And, yeah. and that is is marketing gold right there. It was. And that was honestly, Baker Mayfield, to your reference, he tried to follow the same path. Yeah. He, I mean, they the, called the, the him. The sauce wasn't the same. The sauce you know, wasn't the same. That season, it wasn't the same. Okay, After a he while, tried. we saw through it. But when he was dug in and the videos yeah. going viral, it was like, oh, okay. And he ended up being, I mean, people people have called him Sober Johnny. I'm not saying sober it was me. Johnny. I have not said that. <laughs> but that has been a reference that I have saw on Twitter. They so, call him, man, Shirley Temple Manziel. <laughs> they call him Shirley Temple Manziel. But Johnny was good, though, too. He wasn't like – I remember, like, having a conversation. I was playing with the Bengals. This is before he got drafted. Zach Robinson, who is now the Rams pass game coordinator. Andy Dalton and Greg McElroy, who's, like, the lead college football analyst. They all were like, oh, no, Johnny Manziel is going to take the league over. He does things that you cannot teach a quarterback. His feel for the game, his vision, his instinct – all of that to watch the documentary and realize he was just out there winging it. So that tells Bro. you he was special. You're right. Like, you are a first-round NFL quarterback, and you never watch film. Like, bro, come Oh, on, he's man. not lying, my boy. 
Yeah, yeah, that's wild. He said, "Yeah, you said he was, he he was, he was in there catching lying. up on seeds. That's Bruh. crazy." The coach called um, me. A question, a question I have for you, and a Go reason ahead. why I thought that you know Manziel was going to work was, you know, I was a Washington fan in a, in a former life, so I was familiar with the with the miracle worker that Kyle Shanahan could be, kind of even before you know everybody yeah. got hit to that. Uh -huh. um, so you know, Kyle Shanahan was there. I thought that you know I just saw what he did with RG three. I saw how he had the world food with Kirk Cousins. <laughs> and was like, you, know, you know, he's going to work some magic with Manziel, but then he left like after Manziel's first year. Right. Like, yeah. so, so, so how, how, how are the, how are the vibes in the locker room when Shanahan <laughs> left, and, you know, of course, and, and seeing that like, bro, if anyone could maybe save Johnny, it's this guy and he's on his way out. I'll tell you right now, Shanahan owes me at least $10 million, at awesome. least 10 million Shanahan and Mike McDaniel between the two of them, who is now the head coach of the, of the dolphins. They owe me $10 million. Had they not left, I would have signed another deal for at least, 15 to 20 million dollars that I probably would have seen 10 million of it because that's how the league works. Right. But they forced their way out of Cleveland after that season because they were forced to play Johnny Manziel. They called me. We were seven and four. They called me like, hey, we're thinking about starting Johnny. And I started laughing because I thought they were joking when the head coach called me. I thought he was playing. He was dead serious. And I was like, yo, you're asking me my thoughts on playing somebody who I know is sleep all day. I know he's not watching film. He threw three picks in a walkthrough before the game. And, like, there's nobody playing defense. It was wild, bro. It was like – and now they're watching the doc. I'm like, oh, he probably did that on purpose. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's that. It, it was a crazy experience that definitely deserved the documentary treatment. Yeah, that, that was wild. Um, you know, he said, like, bro, he said it stopped being fun to him at rookie camp. I was like, yeah, yeah bro. Yeah, yeah. This ain't – yeah. I seen Johnny smile. Up, I seen Johnny have a fun time one time. And it was because he was high. That's a fact. Like, there was one time he was super personable, walking around, dapping everybody up, smiling. And it was because he was, he was like, that night before, he was, it was like probably one of the nights he was talking about in the dock. He had went out and kicked it. And it was right. so visible, everybody was talking about it. Like, oh, Johnny, Johnny's on one. So somebody else that got a documentary treatment coming up that was a little bit of a surprise is uh, the other Kelsey, Jason Kelsey. And I was a little shocked by this. I ain't going to lie. I'm a big Kelsey fan. Let's give a round of applause for the Kelseys. They're on a they're on a Lynn Sanity type run right now. I mean, three yeah, Super ball. Bowls between them, hella Pro Bowls. They hosting SNL. They got one of the hottest podcasts in sports media. Um, but I was I was a little shocked by a Jason Kelsey doc that's coming on on Prime. Not only because uh, he's an offensive lineman, which nobody cares about O line in the history of sports. He's a center, so I don't know if you know, like being a center in is like the worst offensive lineman. They get the lowest lowest paid. It's like being a I don't even know what the comp is in basketball. Maybe like a defensive specialist for a championship team. Right. Like it's like just a some protector. Like if you have to replace one of your 22 starters, it's the center. Like I'm telling you, it's like, you know, but he's been really really good, right? But the reality is and I I think he would also understand this. What we love about Jason Kelsey is the fact that he's Travis Kelsey's brother. That might be a little over the top, but that's Otherwise, there's no reason. There's no other reason why O line get that kind of love. I don't know what your thoughts are on Jason Kelsey. Maybe I'm wrong. You, you know, I'm I'm actually not mad at it because I think if you look at the two Kelsey brothers, because you know yep. this was a documentary done over the course of last season. I think Jason has the most interesting story last year. Because, Absolutely. You know, yeah, because you know this guy, he's he's the best center in the league, on the best O line in the league, blocking for the breakout quarterback of last season. You know, quarterback who you know who has had his ups and downs. We know the whole Bama Oklahoma story with Hurts, right? Uh -huh. Last season was his third season in the NFL, and it started to really click for him. And here you have you know Kelsey being his center, his sworn protector for this kid who finally found his way. Like you 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 know, and then they make it to the Super Bowl, and Kelsey is going up against his brother's team, and he's actually going to be going one on one with the guy who's perhaps the best, you know, defensive tackle in the league with Chris Jones, right? You know, they put up a valiant effort, but fall short. That's that Hollywood, man. Like, I think that's way more yeah. interesting than just seeing Travis Kelsey out there grittying and winning the Super Bowl. You know <laughs> I, I agree. I agree. And I, I, I'm i serious. This is where this is journeyman. We love to watch the underappreciated get their shine. So I absolutely right. love the fact that he's getting a documentary. It's just weird. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just be honest. Like, again, even the example you gave. We're doing a Jason Kelsey documentary, not a Jalen Hurts documentary. That's why don't, you don't find that suspicious, brother. You don't find <laughs> that suspicious. That's what yeah. I'm saying. It's just I'm I'm I love to see it. I'm just I'm curious as why we're seeing this. My is all I'm saying, Tyler. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, whoever you know had the the vision a year ago, like. 
I don't know what they saw, but I, I think I think it worked out great for him. Like I said, I think it's going to be an interesting one. I, 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 I mean, and, and, and to your credit, what you said, like the most interesting thing is that he's Travis's brother. I mean, there is a good, there's a great dynamic those two have there, right? Like, you know, Jason's the more reserved country type, kind of, you know, Midwestern potato yep. and gravy type dude. And, exactly. you know, Travis Kelsey is the flashy one, right? So, yep. so yeah, you know, I, I, I do think that, I, I think his personality is going to, you know, shine a bit here because I think for a documentary, you don't want the guy who's on 10. You don't want to watch two hours of the guy on 10 the whole time, right? <laughs> it's too much. You need, you need some stability. You need to hit cruise control every now and then. You feel me? So. You, you do got to hit cruise control. Here's here's my real factual take. I think Jason is more entertaining than Travis, and I love Travis. one of my boys. But I think Jason is more entertaining. And I also have a take that if Jason, when he retires, if he's one of those old linemen that loses like 70, 80 pounds, He'd probably be more, he'd be better looking than, than Travis. Travis gets oh. a lot of love because, they, you know, the girls think he's he's one of the, the most good looking dudes. I have a take that I think Jason is actually probably going to be the better looking one if he loses a lot of weight. Hey, hey, I, I'm going to tell you, that beard was doing a lot of heavy lifting for Travis Kelsey because he shaved that. <laughs> and they turned on him immediately, didn't they? Yeah. All right. Well, when we come back, we're going to talk about another documentary in the making and our guy, Michael Orr, who has been blindsided. Welcome back to Journeyman. We got my man Juju Gotti joining me and Dragonfly Jones today on Journeyman. Juju, what's up, man? Man, we in the streets of Miami, Florida right now. You feel me? <laughs> Salute to Dragonfly Jones, bro. I'm a big fan my of you, man. What hey, up, bro, bro. you're funny as hell on the line. We can talk about that later. <laughs> I appreciate now. Salute you, bro. To you though, brother. All right, look, yes, look man. So much love on the Journeyman podcast, but we had you on last week, Juju, and we appreciate you. But this week, it's like. This is the real thing, because you got a real-life yeah, yeah. insight to this next topic. Look, look, I see, because you got them diamonds on. I know it's the real deal. I can't <laughs> even see scrapes since I walked in this mother trucker. But, hey, here we are. Hey, Dragonfly, look, you want some? You want love, bro? If you want to feel like you're on top of the world, you got to get Juju around you. The most positive <laughs> yeah, energy, man. energy that you'll good ever, juju ever be around. Juju, you feel it, great Juju. That's where it comes from. But, I, look, so Michael Orr is suing the Tui family. And if you don't know, the Tui family, who are the subjects of the Oscar-winning film, Oscar. Blindside. You feel me? Big uh, capital O on that Oscar. Capital O on that Oscar, right? Gotcha. So that so it comes out. Michael Orr is is suing uh, the family because in in his own words, they tricked him into signing adoption papers, and they took over basically his business at that time. At a, at a time where he's like not really knowing what's going on, yeah. he uh, they essentially usher him to the uni, uh, Ole Miss to go play at Ole Miss, and then they go make millions of dollars off of what a lot of people will say is one of, if not the best, football sports movie, not my opinion, uh, In the Blind Side, starring Sandra Bullock. He should sue Sandra Bullock as well. Um, oh, damn. Just kidding. I love Sandra. She Sandra, <laughs> Sandra for the people. Uh, but, <laughs> Juju, the reason why you're an expert here is because you were an extra in the movie Blind Side. You feel no me? Way. We've been in the streets of Atlanta, Georgia. We got the Tomerville Projects. We was outside. You what did? was your role? Tell, 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 tell Tyler what your role was in Blind Side. I was screen N word number three. You did. <laughs> you feel me? Fresh, fresh on, on set. You did. So when Sandra comes to the hood, yeah. you are front and center as, you know, you one of the hood. You're right. They the hood say, homies back they in. Say, they say, act like she actually walking up on you in the hood. At that time, he didn't know if it was rated R or rated PG-13. Uh -huh. They said, say whatever. Just act like this mm, is coming up. He was one of them kind of uh, white guys. Salute to my Caucasian brothers. We see y'all. <laughs> you feel me? The Caucasian Mountains. But he was like, yeah, say whatever to her. So I'm giving her everything. I'm like, mm. yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the fuck? Yeah. Yeah, that's wild. They told you. To say whatever to Sandra Bullock, and you was just like, cool. She auntie from yeah, now on. You that's ain't actually, even, actually my auntie. You, mean, you feel me? We, you we, ain't we, even we question blood. it. Like, I want to know where this is going to be, how it's going to come out. The trajectory of my life at that point, uh -huh. it was our uh, uh, Coke 45 and Black and Miles. You feel me? So <laughs> wherever that took me. Oh, you was, was ready there. for the moment then. You hey, feel man. me, Dragonfly? You, you, got, yeah. you just got paid to just, just curse out a white lady, hey. basically. Bye. The American dream. Yeah, you might. They might put you in some some history books at some point. <laughs> but but as you say that though, Michael Orr was there. Was you he? Feel me on really? on set. Yeah, mm. we was in the hood. Michael Orr walked up because it was a big rumbling about. Oh damn, that's him right there. You uh -huh. feel me? So it's to me, it's kind of oh dang, it's it's shocking to hear that he wasn't a fan of the movie and in part of, and in part also the the people right. involved because. If you wasn't a fan of none of that back then, what you doing walking up on set getting love in the hood for? Yeah. Kissing babies, shaking hands, getting high fives. So, hey, if it wasn't cool then, what's going on, big bro? Let I us am, know. I am interested because it sounds like 
maybe he didn't know what like the final product was gonna was gonna right. look like. Right. Tyler, what was your what what was your reaction when you saw the news? Um, I wasn't particularly blindsided, but oh, no, there it is. Hello, <laughs> I hit it with the dad joke one time for the one time. But um, I will say this: I I always felt like it was a lot of cat in it because so it much felt cat. like a movie you know, that was kind of put together by white people who really do not deal with black people in, in any meaningful capacity. Um, but, you know, I thought it was cap in, in a lot of, like when homie said he never had his own bed before yeah. or when she just found him that walking the down one. the streets on Thanksgiving and all, you know, all that type of. <laughs> that was the one Hallmark for everybody. Movie. But I did not think that, that they were, you know, exploiting a homie, extorting him or, or, or what have you. I did not think that they was, you know, cashing out and then robbing that man for millions. I did not see that part coming. You know, I, I I knew it was fishy. Well, I never liked the movie. I'll be honest with you. Damn, I thought, bro. I, I mean, I think you're, I, th- I think your role, Juju, bro, I gave was it all snub. I, had. I feel like you should have won an Oscar. Absolutely. That would, for two uh, seconds of acting, Juju, I don't know if I've ever seen you, somebody put a performance together like that. Thank but you, if bro. I'm being honest, I hated that movie. For the same reasons you just said, Tyler, and what's funny is my brother, who also played in the NFL for nine years, he went to go see it with his kids, his five kids. And the part where they said, I've never had one of these before. Yeah. What, you never had a room? A bed. He, Come on, he stood up and he made his kids stand up. His son actually went to go play football at Penn State. Yeah. But they, they, they all stood up and they walked out of the theater. Oh. He took his kids out of the theater and they never finished the movie. That, they ain't see my dog Juju's part enough. They ain't right. even, they they ain't saying, even get the Juju's part. I ain't gonna lie to you. They hit my heart when he said, oh, what? <laughs> oh, man. I said, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, bro. So I, I wasn't surprised. But what raised some red flags to me, when I, when I would play against Michael Orr, and this is like around the time he was obviously with the Ravens. So after the game, mm-hmm. I remember like we were shaking hands, and I was like, yo, congrats on the movie. And I hadn't seen it at that point. And he wasn't like, yo, I appreciate it. That's what's up. It was He didn't want to talk about it. Oh. So he was very, you could tell even then, he wasn't happy around the portrayal of him, which to be honest, he's just big, dumb, poor, right, right. can't hardly speak, don't know nothing. I mean, Sandra not only got cussed out by you and her, she also taught him how to play left tackle, which is crazy. Right. Uh, right. So I, I mean, I'm, not, I'm not surprised by it. It is, it is a disheartening like story because I always say there's a thin line between empowerment and exploitation. And I never understand people who want to insert themselves into the spaces that – other people occupy and are experts at and make themselves the center or take the credit, which happens in sports all the time. It happens with agents. It happens with coaches. Right. I had a coach in college um, after I made it to the league, you know, and he, he wasn't, he, he wasn't, he wasn't a great coach. He wasn't a bad dude, but just not a great, not a great coach. And he, he, he told me, he said, you know, I've, I've always tried to be a father figure to you. And I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? I got a dad, right. bro. Get, Get, like, what is your obsession with trying to make yourself a part of a story that you're not in? That's that's what's crazy to me about the the Michael Orr situation. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna tell you another part in that movie that was just pure USDA grade A certified cat was <laughs> when he took when he took you know the the the, the state test to become you know uh, academically eligible to to get a D1 scholarship or whatever, uh-huh. and they said you know he scored low on the academic part, but he scored very high with protective instincts. What? Type of test has protective instincts, dog. I done took all types of tests, bro. Like, you know what I'm saying? I done went to college. I was an AP kid in high school. I done took all types of standardized state tests. I ain't never seen no protective index on none of the results I ever got back, dog. The only question on that guy is, protective will you put your instinct. arm in front of the passenger seat if the if, uh, if airbag about to go off? They took that yeah. man through a combine and said, oh, he, he's, he can't read, but he's a great left tackle. Right, right. Yeah, they did my boy all dirty. Like, she had to explain to him to that being left tackle is like protecting his little brother. Like, bro, he knows how football works. Like, he don't need to, <laughs> you know, go that right. Yeah, it was insulting as bro. It like, was, and, like bro. I said, I really ain't fuck with the movie as a, as a premise at first. <laughs> but now that I know that they robbing my boy and lying on him, now nah, we need justice for Big Mike, dog. Justice Bruh, for Big Mike, I man. think you should do that, Dragonfly, because you are an expert in this field. I think you should break <laughs> down the movie The Blind Side 30 minutes at a time and put yes. out episodes of what the hell is going on actually. You feel me? <laughs> actually. Yeah, I, I, might have to, I might have to watch it, you know, with, with, with my cap goggles on, you know? <laughs> <laughs> just just a, a quick rewatch. That, right. that, is, that is wild. Not only the protective instincts the other scene in there is when uh he's like getting uh interrogated by the ncaa and if you go back and watch that scene which has been circulating on social media she got the whole thing right Right. and it's funny i was like yo you you really did this movie told on yourself on a slick 
and tried to turn it around and make yourself the hero right. in it. That's that's some that's some diabolical shit right there. Right, you try to be heartwarming with your uh, thievery. That's <laughs> messed is, up. Bro. That's crazy. She's in there like so. I it it's going to set a precedent that boosters can just move in and adopt any prospect to try to get them to go to a school. And he's like, no, it's not like that. And I'm like, that, looking back, it was exactly like that. Exactly like that. I actually feel bad for Michael. I really I really, and honestly and truly do because it's messed up. Yeah. yeah. I made my money off the blind side, and he did apparently. So. How much money do you make <laughs> off the blind side? Hey, man, oh, oh, I don't know what's going on there. Salute to Dragon Black Jones. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> Juju told me in the break he going to join a class action suit with Michael Orr because he, th- he felt like he didn't get paid any residuals either. You feel me? We, hey, we, we struggling. They be, hey, every Thanksgiving, I be seeing them. You feel me? You see town, damn, the blind side, damn it. You ain't getting nothing. Who getting that money? Slow the sack after. You, mean, you feel me? We outside. <laughs> that black and mild that was in your ear in the scene, was that yours or they, they gave that to you? Look, they gave me that cherry guy. He was a cherry black and mild. At, at that time in my life, uh, the reggae, the regular, was the uh-huh. preference. You feel me? I prefer the <laughs> reggae black and mild and the uh, Coke 45. But at the same time, they had High Life and they had O'Doul's. They put some uh, non-alcoholic O'Doul's for me out of the drink. You feel me? <laughs> and the cherry black and mild. You, the O'Doul's in the O'Doul's, hood? What, right. what hood was this? As I'm saying, it was Tomerville Projects. It was the hood, the young L.A. Salute it back in the day, you know, you might, it might be before your time, but young L.A., that was his projects, and it was all out there. It was a big deal. Salute to Auntie Sandy, man. I got your back forever, sis. Oh, oh my <laughs> gosh. Tyler, when, you, when, you're, when you're seeing this news, now obviously we all knew, I don't want to say we all knew, but I think it does undo, like, on this show, and especially Juju, Juju has obviously an affinity for Blindside. I mean, that's not natural. You're in the movie. I get it, Juju. But I feel like most people regard this, I'm not even kidding, as one of the best sports movies. I roll my eyes every time, and I don't know if anybody else is like that, and yet hindsight is 2020. But like when you when you think about Blindside prior to this news coming out, did you look at it favorably? Like Um, I knew it was but I knew uh, the masses loved it. You know what I'm saying? Like my mama, for instance, she loved it. Like my mama does never watch football. And I remember when the Ravens won the Super Bowl, she texted me the next day, yay, blindside. She ain't even called it new by his <laughs> oh, name. Nah, my dude. <laughs> she called bro blindside, you feel me? Oh. So yeah, it, it's for sure, you know, one of those feel good movies that don't feel good anymore to the people who it might've felt good to. Before. Oh man, we should already be making this doc, man. Yeah, I, 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 ho- I hope this, this spawns like, Bishop Sycamore, like three versions of, <laughs> of a scam doc. You know what I'm saying? Because it, it it absolutely deserves it. I comp um, the blind side as like the Macklemore of sports movies. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Macklemore's time. album prevented Kendrick Lamar from winning best best hip hop album. Right. And how do you feel about that uh, the, uh, Academy? Like looking back on that. Looking back on that. Listen to the damn pawn shot one time right now. And listen to <laughs> thrift the word, shop. Thrift shop. Pawn shop. Whatever the hell he was talking about. That's listen to version. that right now today, Academy. Come on, get over yourself. It was blind. garbage back then and it's super garbage now. It's, just, it's, right. it's warm heated over Ugh. garbage. Come Ugh. on, man. With aging, a fur coat. Aging like milk. <laughs> like milk. All right, let's 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 take a break. Let's talk a little football and basketball news when we get back. All right, let's talk a little NFL news. There was a story that came out this week about Kyle Shanahan talking about the end of last season when all his quarterbacks went down. Jimmy G went down, Brock Purdy went down, Trey Lance, and he was like, if they had made it through that last game against the Philadelphia Eagles, he had lined up Phillip Rivers to come back and start in the Super Bowl for the San Francisco 49ers. And I'm looking at the rundown, and Jeff has asked, like, do you think this is something he would have re- really really done? And would it have been the craziest sports story of all time? Drew, I'm going to start with you. What do you think? Bro, it's the cap is of all cap. It's cap. I no, all right. It's cap, dude. Does somebody go to his phone. Do you have Phillip Rivers number in your phone? <laughs> bro, yeah, this is the capest sentence ever, bro. Nah, that wasn't lined up. You had your heart set on Brock Purdy. Then it tragically threw the arm out of whatever happened. You did not know Phillip Rivers. He don't know you. So it's capped out. <laughs> Salute to you, but you capped out, big bro. Juju said he capped out. Tyler, what you think, man? I would I wouldn't doubt it. Like, you know, we, like we discussed, you know, earlier, Hawk, about how Kyle Shanahan's a, a quarterback was where like this would have been the the ultimate heat check for him. I think that he probably believes wholeheartedly he could have won with, you know, 53-year-old Phillip Rivers who hasn't played in 20 years hopping out there and, and going <laughs> under center. I'm with you. I'm with I'm with Tyler Ju. You you wrong on this one. It's not uh, cap, bro. This is the kind of stuff that Kyle Shanahan like thrives on, yo. Really? He wants to put himself in situations where and it's, he's a competitor and he likes to yeah. put the pressure on himself for everybody to look and be like, damn, I can't believe that you went out there and won under those circumstances. Bruh, y'all the experts, so if y'all telling me that, I gotta <laughs> believe it. 
But I just, <laughs> when I heard it, I was like, boy, he the most capped out person on that side of the Mississippi River. I don't think mean? he capped out. I think he just a wild boy. I think he just whole hard believes he yeah. could have won the Super Bowl with right. that man. And he he is wrong. And I am Kyle Shanahan's, I'm a, I'm a believer. I played for him. He is my best coach that I've ever had. Best offensive coordinator, hands down. Not even close. But there is no way in hell they were going to win that Super Bowl <laughs> against the uh, Kansas City Chiefs, not because Philip Rivers doesn't have the ability, or because it's anything in his coaching. Philip Rivers has ten kids, bro. There is no Talk about it. You can't be a good father to ten kids and be great at anything else. Yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, as men, it is my. When I see people who are in super good shape, yeah, and are at the top of their craft in their job, I'm like, you're like a halfway good dad. Because there's not enough time to be... There's not enough time to be great at all three things. <laughs> Something has to suffer. Something got to and he got 10 of them. He got 10 of them. <laughs> Bro, I know if you got like 10 kids, there got to be some who you just really... Don't like. <laughs> like right? You just really don't don't like, don't care about. Don't I know you to gotta him. have your favorites, bro. If you got ten of them, bro, like you think you, about that, bro. You right? Because you can't budget out your your your, your parenting <laughs> equally to ten. Like some gonna have to stick out. Some gonna have to knock themselves out of contention. You know what I'm saying? Some of, like some gonna have to show some personality or something. Some of them are raising themselves. There's yes. <laughs> a couple of his kids. If you have 10 children, a couple of your kids are raising yourself. So, yeah. so Philip Rivers, they always debate whether he's a, a Hall of Fame quarterback or not because he yeah. doesn't have a Super Bowl. There is no way in hell he could have won a Super Bowl. You have too many kids to win a Super Bowl. There is no way. Bro, imagine how many times he watched Moana. Bro. <laughs> he done seen that bit. Threw him back. Every there time. is no way. And I think he's a good dad. That's why he keeps having kids. And like I said, there is no way you could be a good father to 10 people. <laughs> Think about having 10 friends that you got to talk to every day. Right. Ain't no way out. Impossible. Not. If you had 10 friends, no kids, and that's all you had to do was talk to 10 friends every day, just talk to them. How would you find a time, let, know, let alone having to raise them, right. teach them like, how to ride bikes, right. teach them how to drive, teach them... You know, like, there's just too much, bro. It's impossible. I actually feel for I don't understand that about how, how guys talk to, like, four or five women at a time. How, bro? bro? How are you listening to how, how a day was four times? Like, bro, <laughs> like, come on. Like, there's no way. Bro, how? I got one redeem for me. You feel me? How was your day? And bam, it's over. If you in super shape and you got five <laughs> women, you are at yeah, whatever job you do for a living. <laughs> and I, that is just, there's there's no way because there's, there's too many, there's, there's not enough hours in the day. Right. Speaking about being at your job, uh, Saints kicker, uh, and that's a bad segue because he wasn't. <laughs> but the part is that he kicked the game-winning field goal and kept being mistaken as a fan because he looks like he's twelve, and so he was stopped coming into the stadium um, and asked for his credential. And even afterwards, he was going out of the player's exit, yeah. and he was still stopped and almost kicked out, which I identify with, man, because I'm five <laughs> seven, and I can't tell you how many conversations. That I had to have in my NFL playing career to prove that I was actually on the team. Yeah. And so I, I I feel for him. But is that not the most relatable thing that you could ever hear about uh, uh, an NFL football player? I mean, I got tough about four, five security guards. Like, I better talk, hey, bro, remember me. <laughs> remember this face. This is the face you're going to see. You fired tomorrow. Watch. Oh, I ain't man. Even, I'm not going to be winning football games for the Kansas City Chief organization. And not being allowed to go places in here. I'm so sorry, You're not uh, doing Mr. It. Whoever owned this book, uh, what's his name, Mr. Hunt, whoever, <laughs> clean this up, bit bro, before I do it. Because <laughs> I know before how I clean it. Up. <laughs> Kicker is like it's a it's a it's a bad position to play. If you want to start, no respect, dog. No respect. No, <laughs> no respect. respect. It's like like I re- I remember when the, when the Urban Meyer bombshell dropped with how the Jacksonville they were talking about how he would just run up on the kicker and just kick. I don't know. Like, the kicker's the one dude on the, on the whole football team. That whole 53 man roster that Urban Meyer put hands and feet on, dog. He's like, you know, oh I'm just going to kick you for no other reason except for the <laughs> right. fact that you're a kicker. Kickers get no respect, right. so much so that Justin Tucker, Justin Tucker is as good at his job as Patrick Mahomes is yes. at his. Like, yeah. as generational talent. And there was video of him hitting like an 80 yard field goal in pregame. He goes in the game, pre, preseason game, hits a 60-yarder. Nobody cares. <laughs> There's really no consensus on, like, the NFL goal, right? Because people say Brady, Rice, Jim Brown, Barry Sanders. Some even say Lawrence Taylor because, you know, it's so many moving parts in football, so it's like an inexact science to compare players across positions. But mm-hmm. I've always been you with you on my stance that, you know, Justin Tucker is better at his job than 
any other NFL player is better at their job. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, like the gap between Justin Tucker and whoever you have at number two is bigger than whatever gap you put up, 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 you know, a, 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 a top guy in the NFL and their number, their runner up. So yeah, I'm with you on that. He's a goat. He's, he's literally like yeah. the most talented and the stats back it up. His performance backs it up. And he's saying opera. You feel me? But, so, he's he, multi-talented, you feel me? but being the best kicker is, you know, like me, I'm the, I'm the best five, seven NFL football oh, receiver. I can't it. even say that because Maurice Jones Jew is way better than me. So I got to say the best five, seven <laughs> receiver in NFL. NFL history, nobody cares. I care. You care, Drew, care. but you're the we only care. person. Yeah, yeah. Because Justin Tucker is the same way. He's the best <laughs> kicker, and ultimately, no one will care. He'll be a Hall of Famer, but he doesn't get nearly the fanfare. Speaking of not getting fanfare, or actually getting too much fanfare, this is going to be a bad take, because it's going to sound like a hypocritical take. Are you guys familiar with Deuce Vaughn? Deuce Vaughn is a 5'5 running back who was drafted by the Cowboys. His father actually worked for the organization, so it was a very feel-good moment. So Deuce Vaughn is he's like that. He he's hitting the spins. He does look like a baby out there yeah. playing in the NFL. And again, I can identify with that. But I'm even taller than Deuce Vaughn. But Deuce is a running back, yeah. which makes him look even crazier because every highlight he's right next to offensive linemen, which makes him look even 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 smaller. But his his clips keep going viral. Yeah. Him like spin moving, making people miss, hitting people with the shakes. And I'm curious if like Deuce Vaughn is really like that. He's a good, solid player, and I think he actually will make the team and be be great. But I don't know if, like, people are acting like he he is the f- the first of his kind. And I'm not referencing myself by any stretch because I, I would never put myself <laughs> in that because it would be disrespectful to people like Darren Sproles. For me, who was like, nice. Darren Sproles is, like, one of the best all-around football players ever. He was 5'6". So I'm just curious if you guys are like, yo, like, we really feel like Deuce Vaughn is going to be like I think he's going to be like that. Like, yeah. no offense, all the shorter brothers I know, mm-hmm. they could play basketball, they could play football, they can run track, they'll beat your ass. Like, it's <laughs> nothing about Deuce that don't say that he's not going to actually do it. And that's what's wrong with the the, argu- uh, the the running back's argument right now as far as getting paid. Uh-huh. Every year you think you the man. Like, Tony Pollard, <clears throat> like, you wouldn't can't tell me that you're not going to be the man next year when Zeke gone. But now here we are, and it's already people who who are catching the public's eye. You feel me? So, and you got that injury. I think Deuce is gonna got. I think he gonna do it. You, you gonna do me? it? I think he gonna go all the way. I think he gonna win the Super Bowl before he done. I think he gonna go down as a Hall of Fame player. You hear it here first. Hall of Fame. Oh, that's Jeez, that's Hall a wild fame. take. That's a you wild take. Dude. Yeah, you hear what you got, first. Tyler? Um, I think he's gonna be good too. Of course, you know. He can't, he's not durable enough to be an every down back, but you know, I think that you know, you can put him in some situations where he'll thrive. Like Darren Sproles has been the, the closest comparison to him, you know, both about the same size, both went to Kansas State. Um, I will say that something that that gives me reason to believe that he's gonna be okay is he's really good at taking contact, right? Like that's what hopped out to me. He doesn't look like he's getting murdered when he gets tackled, you know yes, what I'm saying? Bro. And that's a very important skill to kind of know how to take contact for a guy that size. Nah, man. I, I I think I don't think he'll be a Hall of Fame player. It's not me hating. This is the expertise. I don't know. It sounds like I've been out was, there. I've like taken a duck those hits. Quack like a duck. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is, I think you made a good point, Tyler. The way he falls, the way he gets hit, yeah, because he gets hit too much. Like I could I could prevent being hit because I'm I played a slot. Yeah. And Darren Sproles, he actually was really good at that. And I would say I, I would encourage you to go watch the way Darren Sproles would take hits versus okay. Deuce. And Deuce is still learning, so we'll give him a lot a chance to do that. But I don't know. I just feel like it's disrespectful to the Maurice Jones Drews of the world okay. and the Darren Sproles, who have honestly, I mean, these are guys that have 10, 15,000 yards yeah. in their career, and we're acting like we've never seen this before when we have. Right, that's right. that's all I'm saying, Jim. Look, and I take my my protocols from you, and I respect you. So, hey, big bro told me it's, it's a different way. I got to believe it. That does it for this episode of Journeyman. Shout out to the people at the DraftKings Network and Metal Arc Media. Shout out to my guy, Tyler Perrier, a.k.a. Dragonfly Jones, and Juju Gotti, the shoddy from Atlanta and star of Blindside. That's <laughs> it for this week's Journeyman. Make sure you journey back next week, same time, same place. And until then... Money Trees is the perfect place for shade, and that's just how I feel.